songs this morning really speak a deep truth. We were stuck. We were in the miry clay and we couldn't get out. And we can't get out. Apart from what the Savior did on the cross. And He took the holy place and put it in our hearts. Because we couldn't go there. The new and living one. How many of you remember watching the TV miniseries Roots? Anybody watch that? Kind of dates us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, came out in 1977, which is how many years ago is that? I hate to even think. It was written by Alex Haley. <laughs> it's the story of Alex Haley's search for his family roots, and it involves the story of a slave named Toby, formerly known as Kunta Kinte. It's all about his abduction on a slave ship and his <coughs> life as a slave in America. The story was, I thought, was absolutely riveting. I watched it as a 17-year-old. It showed for eight consecutive nights and had 100 million viewers. Half the country was tuned in to watch that miniseries, Roots. The last episode has Alex Haley in an African village. If you remember, the village elder is reciting all of the names of the people that had come from there. And the sun was hot, and after hearing name after name after name, Alex Haley's eyes kind of glazed over and he went to sleep in the hot African sun. And then the old man recited the name Kunta Kinte as, a, as a Haley was fast asleep. And I think the whole country had kind of a collective gasp that, oh no, he's going to miss it. The thing that he's been looking for all this time. Well, Alex suddenly jerks awake and with his eyes wide open he asks, did you say Punta Quinte? And his long search for his roots that had led him halfway around the world was finally over. Nehemiah 11 and the first half of 12 consist of names. Names of the sons of Judah. Names of the sons of Benjamin. Names of the Levites. Names of people in responsible government positions. Names of towns. Names of the fathers' households. Names of those who served in the temple. It's the kind of reading that makes your eyes glaze over and puts you to sleep. But there in Nehemiah 12, verse 10, appears a family lineage just out of nowhere. All of a sudden begins this family lineage. And that lineage begins to knit together for us an important story. One of the names should be familiar to you. And Jeshua became the father of Joachim. And Joachim became the father of Eliashib. And Eliashib became the father of Joiada. And Joiada became the father of Jonathan. And Jonathan became the father of Jedua. Any of those names ring a bell? It's the family lineage of Eliashib. If you remember from last week, Eliashib was connected somehow to Tobiah. He was close to Tobiah. Actually, the NASB uses the word related. And that relationship developed into a great evil. Eliashib, 
who at the time of, uh, of the writing in, in chapter 12 oversaw all of the chambers of the temple. And he took one of the chambers that was used for the storage of the people's tithes to support the Levites and the people who did worship in the temple. And he converted that storeroom into a spacious apartment for Tobiah, the Ammonite official, who worked for Sanballat, the sworn enemy of Israel. The apartment was the tip of the iceberg, the visible part of a stronghold forged by the enemy through Jewish intermarriages with people outside the Jewish community. So the Spirit of God plants this family lineage out of the blue in chapter 12. It'd be easy to ignore. But if we did, we'd miss out on an important lesson that the Word of God has for us this morning. This is a diagram of that lineage. Yeshua was a respected priest. He came with Zerubbabel 70 years earlier from, uh, from Babylon. He was with the first great wave of exiles from Babylon. 43,000 Jews returned to their homeland. He and Zerubbabel laid the stones of the altar according to the floor plan of the temple except there was no temple. It was just out in the open. It was a courageous display of worship to Yahweh in the midst of threats and oppositions from the people of the land. His son Joachim, Elijah's father, was also a priest the same generation as Meshulam if you remember, one of the magnificent five that took on two sections of the wall, the rebuild of the wall around Jerusalem. Same generation, but different families. And we're given the name, names of Eliashib's son, Joiada, his grandson, Jonathan, and his great-grandson, Jadua. We've been told a little bit about his son, Joiada. Even one of the sons of Joiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was a son-in-law to Sanballat the Horonite. So I drove him away from me. Remember them, O oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. This passage, when you put it in the context of the times, reveals a few things about joy. Marriages were tightly controlled in that culture. Parents selected mates for their children. How was it that joy would have selected a daughter of Sandal at the Horonite to marry his son? Or consented to it? How could joy have made that arrangement in light of the numerous prohibitions of Scripture against intermarriage. And in light of what the country had gone through in Ezra chapter 10, Ezra addressed the issue of Jewish intermarriage. Let me turn to that. Just read a portion of it to you. This is the, the angst and the struggle that Ezra had in dealing with this issue. Now while Ezra was praying and making confession, weeping and prostrating himself before the house of God, a very large assembly, men, women, and children, gathered to him from Israel, for the people wept bitterly. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam answered and said to Ezra, We have been unfaithful to our God. 
and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. Yet now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. So now let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and their children according to the counsel of my Lord and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this matter is your responsibility, but we will be with you. Be courageous and act. Then Ezra rose and made the leading priests, the Levites, and all Israel take oath that they would do according to this proposal. So they took the oath. Obviously, Ezra was not looking forward to having to deal with this issue. It involved a lot of people, a lot of children, I think uh, Eliashib would have been one of the, of the fathers in that situation. <coughs> and his son Joyada would have been directly affected by that had he married a foreign woman. But in spite of that, they saw what happened. And the lesson of it fell on deaf ears. Although there's no indication that either Eliashib or Jehoiada was caught up in it. Jehoiada allowed his son to be caught up in it. Having seen the damage that that caused and the pain that that caused people. Notice Nehemiah's shift to the plural here at the end of this passage. <coughs> Remember them, oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood. One of the people, of course, that Nehemiah talked about must have been the son. Probably his name was Jonathan because we're given his name. One of the children that was affected by it would have been Jadua, his grandson. But, as I said, the lesson of all that that happened fell on deaf ears. So when Nehemiah turns it to the plural, he must have been talking about Jonathan and his father, Joy, in allowing that kind of thing to happen. What a legacy Jehoiada left his children cut off from Israel. There's another son of Eliashib described in the book of Ezra. Ezra is the companion book to Nehemiah. When you read one, you should read the other. As Ezra was beginning to deal with the issue of intermarriage, we read, as we read in uh, verses 1 through 5, it wasn't an issue of his choosing. He dreaded having to deal with it. So here's verse 6. Then Ezra rose from before the house of God and went into the chamber of Jehohanan, the son of Eliashib. Although he went there, he did not eat bread or drink water. For he was in mourning over the unfaithfulness of the exiles. I thought about that. You know, it would be customary in that day for a person to offer refreshments to such a notable priest such as Ezra if he came to my house. And yet, Ezra wouldn't take anything from him. It wasn't a pleasant visit. <coughs> Why did Ezra even go to Jehohanan's house? And why does the Spirit of God give us this kind of detail? 
verses 7 through 10. And they made a proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem to all the exiles that they should assemble at Jerusalem. And that whoever would not come within three days according to the counsel of the leaders and the elders, all his possessions should be forfeited and he himself excluded from the assembly of the exiles. Here's what I think. It doesn't tell us this. You kind of have to form your own conclusions and write between the lines. But I think Jehohanan was an influential priest. And Ezra needed his cooperation in order to pull off verses 7 and 8. However, Ezra would not fellowship with the man because he was what we would call a progressive priest. He wanted to be open-minded about this business of intermarriage. Don't be so hard. Don't be so narrow-minded. And I think after a great deal of arm-twisting, Ezra prevailed and got Jehohanan's cooperation, although I believe it was a grudging cooperation. Thus we see the second son of Eliashib. It's interesting to me that there is another name of another son in Nehemiah. Anybody remember what Tobiah's son was named? Jehohanan. And Jehohanan married the daughter of Meshulam. It's in uh, Nehemiah 6.18. Is that a coincidence that both of these sons are named Jehohanan? I don't think so. Perhaps Eliashib's relationship with Tobiah, which the scriptures say was close, included the intentional naming of each son with the same name. Perhaps they grew up together. Perhaps they were, what we would say, joined at the hip. You know, I have a little bit of experience in with this business of naming. When I was in the park, we had a little donkey team that pulled the buckboard in parades. Some of you may have seen that in past years. People would always ask, well, what's the name of, the, of this donkey? And I'd say, donkey boy. <laughs> well, what's the name of that donkey? Donkey boy? Because I never <coughs> took them separately. They were always together. So if I wanted their attention, I only had to say one name. <laughs> donkey boy. Maybe it was like that with Jehovahnen. Always together. Always in one house or the other. And it was just easier to get them both with the same name. We don't know, but why would parents name their sons the same name? There's yet a third son of Eliashib. We see him in Nehemiah 12.23. The sons of Levi, the heads of the father's household, were registered in the book of the Chronicles up to the days of Johanan, the son of Eliashim. We're told that a record was kept of the sons of Levi. Why was this important? 
The Levites were the unlanded tribe. They didn't have any property. Their property was the Lord himself. And the arrangement was made that the Levites would live off of the tithes of the people. The registration and the record ensured that only legitimate Levites served in this capacity and thus they would be supported by the people. God didn't want just anybody shepherding his people, especially those from outside the faith. So what would happen if there was no record? There would be no basis for determining an authentic Levite. Yeah, it would take some time, a generation, but then that basis would be lost and anybody could serve as a Levite. All he had to do was say he was one. Jehohanan stopped the practice of keeping up the register of the Levites. So here you have the three sons of Eliashib. What a legacy they leave. Jehohanan obscures the, or excuse me, Johanan obscures the Levitical priesthood. Joiada willingly unites his family with the enemy of Israel, Sanballat himself. And Jehohanan is of such a progressive persuasion that Ezra won't even fellowship with him. And these three come from a father who is allied with Tobiah the Ammonite. And at the same time, he's attained the highest ranking position in Israel, the high priest. This is how the enemy's stronghold worked out in Elisha's family. And Nehemiah said, remember them, for they have defiled the priesthood. How would you like to be head of a family like that? How could something like this happen with one who had such a courageous grandfather like Jeshua? How could a man like Eliashib, who had attained the rank of high priest of Israel, have such a profound inner collapse, which continued on through his sons? As a side note, chapter 12 gives us the names of those who are entrusted as gatekeepers of the storehouses in the temple. When Eliashib turned the chamber for the tithes into an apartment for Tobiah, he had to either buy off or bribe one of these gatekeepers. Here it is, names, names and names. Mataniah and Babakiah, Obadiah, Meshulam, Talmud, and Akab were the gatekeepers keeping watch at the storehouses of the, of the gates. Which one did Elisha buy off? We're not told. There's a, a list of people at the end of Ezra who had married foreign wives. The name Mataniah appears four times. And the name Meshulam appears once. My guess it was one of those. And... Eliashib could pressure one of these keepers of the gates with the issue that, yes, you've got a foreign wife. You're going to lose your job. But I'll go easy on you if we can do this. That's the way the enemy works. Eliashib, the high priest of Israel, knew and exploited it. Obviously, Eliashib disregarded the Word of God and passed on that disregard or even contempt to his sons. 
Consider a scripture that Elisha would have known by heart. Watch yourself that you make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land into which you are going, lest it become a snare in your midst. But you are to tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars and cut down their ashram, for you shall not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they play the harlot with their gods and sacrifice to their gods and someone invites you to eat of his sacrifice and you take some of his daughters for your sons and his daughters play the harlot with their gods and cause your sons also to play the harlot with their gods. Is there any question as far as what that means? I mean, the scriptures are pretty clear. And as I've read Deuteronomy this past couple of months, Deuteronomy is really an amazing book. Very clear. Elisha would have also been familiar with Joshua's farewell address to Israel. Joshua told the people, For if you ever go back and cling to the rest of these nations, these which remain among you, and intermarry with them, so that you associate with them, they with you, Know with certainty that the Lord your God will not continue to drive these nations out from before you. But they will be a snare and a trap to you and a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land that the Lord your God has given you. The meaning here is clear, is it not? And Elisha knowingly violated both of these scriptures as the spiritual leader of Israel. Well, all of this was written for our instruction. That's what Romans says. It was all written for our instruction. So what are the lessons here for us? What are the applications? <coughs> As I thought about this, several came to mind. One is that you can't ride the spiritual coattails of another person before God. Eliashib may have been appointed high priest probably because he was the grandson of Jeshua, but he had to answer to God for his own character, his own faith or lack of it, and the legacy that he left behind through his son. Our relationship with Christ must be our own. And it has to be real and personal. We can't ride the coattails of another. The second is that fathers, you can't expect your children to follow Christ if you don't lead the way. Amen. I thought of this morning of a, of a song that was popular years ago. <clears throat> Let me just read some of the lyrics to you. My child arrived just the other day, came to the world in the usual way. But there were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away. And he was talking before I knew it. And as he grew, he'd say, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know, I'm going to be like you. My son turned 10 just the other day. He said, thanks for the ball, Dad. Come on, let's play. Can you teach me to throw? I said, not today. I got a lot to do. He said, that's okay. And he walked away, but his smile never dimmed. And he said, I'm going to be like him. Yeah, you know I'm going to be just like him. Well, he came from college just the other day. So much like a man, I just had to say, son, I'm proud of you. Can you sit for a while? He shook his head and said with a smile, What I'd really like, Dad, is to borrow the car keys. Can I see you later? Can I have them, please? I've long since retired. My son moved away. I called him up just the other day. I said, I'd like to see you if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, Dad, if I can find the time. You see, my new job's a hassle and the kids have the flu, but it's sure nice talking to you, Dad. 
It sure been nice talking to you. And as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. And the cats in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you coming home, son? I don't know when, but we'll get together then, Dad. We'll have a good time then. I think maybe it was written for guys like Elijah. Thanks to God, it's never too late to repent. It's never too late to be a godly example. I'm impressed with the story of Manasseh in 2 Chronicles 33. Let me just read you parts of it to just give you a flavor of it. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king and he reigned in Judah for 55 years. For he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he made his sons pass through the fire in the valley of Behinnom. And he practiced witchcraft, used divination, practiced sorcery, and dealt with mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. And then he put the carved image of the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which, David, of which God said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. Thus Manasseh misled Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the sons of Israel. He was worse than the countries that God drove out to make a way for them. Well, it wasn't the end of the story. The Lord brought the commanders of the army of the kings of the king of Assyria against him, and they captured Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze chains, and took him to Babylon. And when he was in distress, he entreated the Lord his God and humbly and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And when Manasseh prayed to the Lord, God was moved by his entreaty and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Well, it was too late for his son Ammon. Ammon reigned for two years after Manasseh. And Ammon, Ammon did just as evil as his father Manasseh had done. But there came along the grandson the son of Manasseh, his name was Joash. He was eight years old when he became king. And a lot of people think that grandfather Manasseh had a huge influence in the life of grandson Joash. And Joash did right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David and did not turn aside to the right or to the left. It's not too late. We, have, we may have royally messed it up, but it's not too late. And God can use a repentant man to have a godly influence in the life of his grandson. The scriptures tell us to still be careful to marry within the faith. That's not just an Old Testament thing. That's a New Testament thing as well. We have to pass that message on to our children. We have to pass that conviction on to our grandchildren. How do you do that? I think one way is to give them a vision of what a loyal, Christ-centered marriage looks like. Amen. And what it can do. And cast for them a vision of a godly mate. 
You have to talk about these things with your children and your grandchildren. Talk about the possibility of what God can do. Those who follow you, look to you. Let the message of your life be clear. Let it be one of faithfulness to Christ. Heidi, would you come and lead us in our final song? Proverbs tells us, Grandchildren are the crown of old men, and the glory of sons is their fathers. Our fathers play such a crucial role in our lives. In many ways they shape us, for good or for bad. Blessed is the child that has a father that he can be rightly proud of who has left him a godly heritage and a good foundation of faith. But what about those that don't have that godly example? And there are many, many people like that. First Peter says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like gold or silver from your futile way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Christ is the Redeemer. His blood bought the new and living way through the new covenant. He took the holy place and put it in the believer's heart that he could approach the living God. He makes all things new. And if you're among the many, that have inherited a futile way of life from your God. There's hope. You can be the one that breaks the chain of futility through the power of the cross and the resurrection of Christ. Amen. You can be the one. And if not you, who will? You be the one to break the pattern and set the new course. Amen. 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 Amen.